an opportunity for worship. We start a new series this morning. Uh, Noel is going to be, be sharing with us this morning. And it's a series called His Glory, My Story. And we chose that very specifically because God is great. God is not great when He works in your life or when He answers your prayer. That is not the determining factor of our great God. Our God is always great. As Job said, even though he may slay me still, still will I praise him. Because our God is great. Not on your circumstance, not how you feel, not on what others are doing to you, not what's happening in the world around us. Our God is great. And so often we think that our story must display his glory. No, his glory is found in our story every single day. And so, yeah, Noel's going to be sharing a little bit of an intro for you, Noel. Um, no pressure. He kept on saying to me, Jason, my story is simple. And I said, amen, because it's his glory that comes out in our simple stories. And so, Noel, come on up. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I just ask you to bless Noel and what you've taken him through and what you've led him to know of you. I pray that you are made great. You're always great. You are great. That his story will reflect our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. So uh, let me start off by saying I'm so glad to see everybody here this morning. And uh, I'm going to just start off by saying this is not a sermon. This is a testimony. But in my testimony, I'm going to refer to God's Word. And uh, I'm going to use uh, something that happened to me recently. A very simple thing, actually, to try and explain to you what God taught me. Um, and I think God taught me some deep things with the simple thing that happened to me. And... Um, I want to start off my testimony by asking you some questions. Uh, and I'm going to choose some victims in my question asking process. So uh, I'm going to start with Andre. <laughs> so, so Andre, I want to take you back to the time of the Israelites. Okay, so then the story of the Israelites has got three portions to it. Egypt, wilderness, promised land. And I want to ask you, where do you think you are living today? So Andre says that he's living in the promised land. Corey, where are you living today? Janine, where are you living today? Promised land. Okay, may I tell you that all of you are wrong? So, so what I had to be taught in the last, let's call it the end of last year, was that our culture in which we live tells us that where we live today, not Richest Bay, South Africa, but where we live, this life is supposed to be the promised land. And when we are faced with challenges, we are kind of disappointed, but this is supposed to be the promised land. But I want to tell you today, no, you're not living in the promised land. All of us are still in the wilderness. But what does the story of the promised land actually tell us? It says to us, there's a beginning, Egypt, through the Red Sea, through the promised land, through the wilderness, and eventually we will get to the promised land. So in my testimony this morning, if I bore you with some technical details, I apologize. And, uh, and if I embarrass myself, I apologize. So like any good story, I need to give you a bit of an introduction. So uh, let me start with my introduction. So I work at Monday Riches Bay. So at Monday Riches Bay, trees, or money, it literally does grow on trees. And um, it's also the smell of progress. <laughs> so, um, but at, at, at Mondi, I've been working there for about 20 years now. Uh, I feel almost embarrassed to say that. But I've been working there for 20 years. And, and recently, 
Um, the mud is getting older, and we had to embark on some, some big uh, replacement activities for, for equipment. So uh, we launched a project, and uh, two of the most complicated portions of this project was replacing or rebuilding our recovery boiler, and also rebuilding our chemical plant. And um, in mid-2020, I was asked, do you want to be part of this project? And uh, at that point in time already, there were these murmurs, oh, things aren't going well, you know, there's some problems, we, I'm sure we're going to make it, etc., etc." So when I was asked this question, I decided I'm going to pray about this. So I went and I prayed about it. I said, Lord, do you think I need to go and join this project team? And the answer was yes. And I prayed again. I said, Lord, are you sure I need to join this project team? And the answer was yes. Okay, so I went and I joined the project team in mid-2020, first on a 50-50 basis, not all my time there, and uh, in December 2020 full-time. And um, as I became part of this project team, I saw, ooh, look, there are problems, we have problems. And, uh, and I very quickly realized that what we have to do, none of us have done before. The technical complexity of what we have to get done, nobody really anticipated when we approved these projects. And our plan is to switch off this mill for two months, no income, rebuild all this equipment and start up again. And I could see that was going to be a challenge. So what does any good Christian do when the lights go on? You start praying. So when I started praying, I said, Lord, I, I think we're going to have problems. And I, and I know we're going to make many mistakes in our planning going forward. But please, I'm asking you, cover our mistakes with your grace. Please do that. Please cover us and help us. Where are we going to forget things and make mistakes or not be on time? I pray that you please cover our mistakes with your grace. Because this is what God says He does for us. Okay, now I need to, I want to add one embarrassing thing to the story, my introduction. So before I went there, I think maybe because they were desperate, um, senior management came to me and said, somebody in senior management came to me and said, said, no, go there and please use this opportunity to opportunity to enhance your own um, stature in the company, to make your name great. I'm, I'm feel embarrassed by saying that, but that's what somebody told to me, said to me. And at that point in time I thought, yeah, he's right, this is a good opportunity. Let me, let me grab this opportunity with both hands and go and prove to everybody how good I am. Okay, so please remember this statement I just made now. It's very relevant for the story later on. Okay, so as we started the planning process of, of specifically the recovery boiler rebuild, we realized very quickly that our original piping scope, the project was approved for 1.6 kilometers of high pressure steam piping, we ended up at 5 kilometers of piping. We ended up with uh, 12,000 welds that had been completed in the shutdown. We ended up with 24,000 weld inches, 1,000 valves, 4,000 fittings, thousands of people. It's no longer a joke. And, and every day that the mother's off, you're losing 23 million, 23 million, 23 million, 23 million, plus all the other costs you have to pay for people to be there. A lot of pressure. Hence, I was praying a lot. Every day, I was praying to the Lord, please cover our mistakes, please help us. Now I want to take you fast forward from the planning process right to the shutters now starting. Our shutdown is starting. All the people on site, everybody's there. The out of about five kilometers of piping, the biggest piping component was a system called the Suplane system. The Suplane system is a system of high pressure piping, high pressure steam piping, that takes steam to the Suplane system that cleans this boiler. There are 86 Suplowers, 400 degrees Celsius, 30 bar pressure steam. It's a legally compliant system. You have to comply to all the legal requirements in the OSH Act the health and safety standards. You can't just go and put the piping in whichever way you want it. So while we were developing the details of the system, I asked my team multiple times, guys, have you checked all the flanges on the system? I don't know if any, everybody in the church knows what a flange is actually. Yeah, it's like a part you eat. No, it's, it's, a, it's basically a piping component that you, that you use to join systems together. You put the bolts through it and you put a gasket in between you and you bolt things together. And I was told on multiple occasions, yes, we've checked all the flanges, no issue. So why was this important to me, to make sure the guys would check the flanges? Because these flanges is not something you buy in any shop in Alta. It's a forged fitting. You need to have a billet of material, special material, 
it gets forced under heat, then it gets machined into the into the right shape. So out of the 86 flanges, what do you think happened to me the second day of the show? As soon as you start taking off the hanging and cladding. One young engineer came to me and said, Oh no, I'm sorry to tell you, but out of the 86 flanges, 50 are wrong. 50 flanges are wrong. So now immediately, this is my worst nightmare that's come true. 50 out of the 86 flanges will not fit. Okay, so now, now I go into a bit of a, a Red Sea depression here. I've got the Egyptians behind me and the, and the Red Sea in front of me. What are we going to do? So what, what does anybody do when you work in a environment like this? You start calling all your contacts, man. Who, who's got a flange? Who's got material? Who's got everything? Nobody could help us. Nobody could help us. Nobody in South Africa could help us. Why? Well, there was one small additional complication. At the same time as we were having our shutdown, we also had the metal workers or metal workers strike in South Africa. All the workshops are closed. So it's literally impossible to find these pages in this country. So now my thought process is start, my doubts not so. I said to God, God, but I don't understand. I've been asking you for a year, please help us. Please cover our, our mistakes. I do not understand why this has happened to me. I do not understand. But again, like a good Christian, when the warning lights go off, in my little car I'm driving, what did I eventually do? Eventually, I referred back to the owner's manual. And uh, in the owner's manual, I ended up initially reading Matthew 4, and uh, then later on Deuteronomy 8. So I want to start off by reading Matthew 4 to you. Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It carries on a little bit further. I'm going to stop at verse 4. You know verse 4 is a quote from Deuteronomy 8. So then I referred back to Deuteronomy 8, and I'm going to read Deuteronomy 8 to you. Deuteronomy 8, remember the Lord. So I'm going to read quite a long piece here, so please try and pay attention. Carefully follow every command I'm giving you today, so that you may live and increase, and may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your fathers. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey, these 40 years in the wilderness, so that he might humble you and test you to know what is in your heart. Whether or not you would keep his commands, he humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out, and your feet did not swell these forty years. Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been disciplining you as a man disciplines his son. So keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams, springs, and deep water sources, flowing in both valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley, vines, figs, and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without shortage, where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks and iron are iron, and from whose hills you will mine copper. So what can, we, what, what can we take from this Deuteronomy 8 story? I think two things for me. Number one, yes, God led them into the wilderness. But number two, the wilderness was not the destination. The promised land was the destination. So let me take this back into my, into my story now. So after reading Matthew 4 and then Deuteronomy 8, I then, I then realized the following. So I said to God, So God, you led me into this wilderness. God said, yes. So God, my missing flanges was not a surprise to you. No. It's not a surprise to me. It's a surprise to you. It's not a surprise to me. So 
So the question I was faced with initially was, do I trust God? Do I really trust God? Who of you can run around uh, a racetrack, a 400 meter race in 40 seconds or 80 seconds? Who can do that here? Richard, you can. I'm sure you can. Why can't you do it, Richard? <laughs> now, you can't say you've done it because you haven't done it. Many of us sitting here today, and even myself, I would say, yes, I have faith. I trust God. But how can you trust God if you've never been forced to trust God? How can you say, I have faith, if I have never had to be pushed to have faith? None of us can say that. None of us can say, I have faith if I've not had to be confronted by the test to actually trust God. If you look at, if you look at the story of many characters in the Bible, this is a repeating thing. It is not natural for us to trust God. It's not natural for us. God has to take us to a position we are, we are forced to trust Him. And we are forced now to have faith. Let me use a very simple example. Let's look at the story of David. This was also relevant to me while I was going through this. So in the story of David, David is an anointed king. As a young boy, he's anointed as the king. Does he become king immediately? What happens to David in between his anointing and his final kingship? Saul tries to kill him. He spends years running through the wilderness. Years and years running through the wilderness. What is the outcome of his years in the wilderness? It's the book of Psalms. It's a person who God says, now this man has got a heart after my own heart. Even David had to learn faith initially through fighting the lions, fighting the bears. It wasn't natural for him. God put him in this position to teach him faith. Why is it important for us to trust God? It's really important to trust God because if you trust somebody, we are more likely to obey him than somebody we don't trust. So Amanda, if you don't trust me at all, and I say, Amanda, I need you to go do A, B, and C, will you do it? Maybe not. Maybe not. But if you trust God, you're more likely to obey Him. Going back to the story of the Israelites. How many times did the Israelites move in the desert? Many times. Do you know that sometimes the cloud was on the tent for one day? Sometimes it was there for two years. Does it make logical sense? It doesn't make sense. What is the point of that? I think the point of that was God was trying to teach them. When I say move, you move. When I stay, stay, you stay. The next portion of the scripture in Deuteronomy refers to testing and humbling. So the first thing I had to learn was to start saying, I actually trust God. I have faith. Before I step off that, let me just add one more thing. The real challenge I had to face then was, do I believe that nothing is impossible for God? Do I really believe that God says, I am in control of the hair that falls off your head. I am in control of the sparrows that live and die. I am the God of molecules. Do we believe it? I'm the God of molecules. Can we understand and believe that the war in Ukraine is not a surprise to God? Can we understand and believe that COVID-19 is not a surprise to God and there was control of it? Can we believe that the unrest in July last year was under God's control? It's very challenging, isn't it? Very challenging to truly believe that our God is in control of everything. Every single thing. Every molecule, every decision, everything. So the deep fundamental thing here is, do we really believe that God is sovereign? Do we really believe God is sovereign? So while I was looking for missing flanges, this is the challenge I had to face. That my God is a God of molecules and of missing flanges.
Moving on to the second point, being tasted. In Deuteronomy, Moses says, God put you in the wilderness to test you, to see if you're going to be obedient to me. So let me frame my story again to you. So now we're in the shutdown. I don't have flanges, we don't have many other things, and actually chaos, to be honest, it's chaos. And um, what happens when you're under pressure, lots of pressure? What happens when things go wrong? What happens? Does your behavior stay the same? Does your demeanor change? Do the words that come out of your mouth, does it change? Do we start to grumble? I think most of us do. I think most of us do. We succumb to the pressure. But God says, I put you in the wilderness to test you, to see if you will obey my commands, regardless of the circumstances. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter if you are tired. It doesn't matter if you've worked 20 days in a row, 12 hours a day. It doesn't matter if half your team has resigned already. It doesn't matter if people think you're going to be fired. It doesn't matter. These things don't matter. It does not matter. What is important to God is, while you're in the wilderness, are you going to obey my command? You know, that comes back to trust again. Are we believing the lies of the devil? Or am I trusting God that in these difficult circumstances, regardless of what I feel, and how tired I am, and how distressed I am, that doing what God says is right is still better for me? That's a big challenge. It's a very big challenge. While you're in the situation under pressure, not to succumb to, to a change in your character, it's extremely difficult. So while I was going through this, um, as a team we had lots of discussions and people were really worried. People are going to be dismissed, we're going to be fired, you know, we're going to delay the shot, people are going to die, a whole bunch of terrible, terrible things. And uh, at one point in time, I, I had to say to people, the one thing we're not going to do is lose our characters. We will not start blaming other people, we will not start becoming devious, we will take ownership and be responsible and be honest. That's what we should be doing. And it's always more difficult to do what is right than it is to do what is wrong. That's unfortunately the way it is. Think about what I read to you in Matthew 4. So when Jesus, after Jesus was in the desert, in the wilderness, he spent 40 days there. He didn't eat, apparently, didn't sleep enough, didn't drink enough. Then the devil came to tempt him. What is the example that Jesus said to us? Did he do what was wrong? No. Even when he was in the wilderness, hungry, tired, he still trusted his father more than his own feelings. He still trusted his father more than the lies the devil put in front of him. So when we're in the wilderness, it's very important for us to understand, I believe, and something I have to learn, that we have to be faith witnesses, not grumblers. So the Israelites in the desert, every time they came to an obstacle, they grumbled. Oh, Lord, there's no water, we're going to die. Lord, there's no meat, we're going to die. There's no food, we're going to die. We want to go back to Egypt, we're going to die. They never understood what the purpose was of God's journey. To humble them, teach them and test them, not to kill them. So when we are faced with challenges, please let's not be grumblers. Let's be faith witnesses. Let's be witnesses to faith and say, I know God did not put me in the wilderness to kill me. He did not put me in the wilderness to make me die. He's got a plan for me. He's taking me to promised land. He is busy sanctifying me. That's why I am here. For no other reason. That's the only reason. There's another aspect in Deuteronomy 8 we haven't spoken about yet. It's called humbleness. God said, I, I, I've taken you through the wilderness to humble you. Again, just like faith, it's very easy for us to say, I'm a humble person. Yes, I'm a humble person. Be humble. Go and read Philippians 2 about being humble. Read humble. Be, be humble. Yes. Let me tell you my story of being humble, of being forced to be humble. So, shut is dragging on, we're all very tired, 
things like uh, according to plan. <clears throat> I realized I appointed some people that cannot do their jobs. I did it. I made a decision. I'm appointing you. And quickly I realized this thing is going south. They can't do their job. Now you have a, now you have a choice. You either fire people or you jump in and help them. So what was I forced to do? I was forced to leave my job, go and sit somewhere else, and do the work that I appointed somebody else to do to make sure it gets done. I hated it, to be honest. I hated it. I hated the, the attitude of these people sitting next to me that I appointed. They still had a bad approach to their jobs, seeing their superior do what they were supposed to do. I hated every second of it. But then in that world of wonderful wilderness, God reminded me of Joseph. So if you look at the life of Joseph, where did Joseph start off? He was their son. He had a robe. He had everything. He had servants. But in God's plan for his life, that's not where he really ended up. He should be at that point in time. So what happened to him? He was sold as a slave. So I think becoming a slave, from up here to becoming a slave, is, is quite a bit of humbling. Was that enough humbling for Joseph? No. God took him and made him a prisoner. And how long was he in the prison? 12 years, 12 or 13 years, I think he was in the prison. After 12 or 13 years of humbling, God said, now you are ready. Now I can use you to save my people in Egypt. Again, it's very easy for us to say, I have faith. It's very easy for us to say, I'm humble. But when God puts you in a situation to really face this now, that's very difficult. Very, very difficult. It's very difficult for me. So, what did I learn from all of this? Did what happened to me in the shutdown, did it kill me? Did it kill anybody else around us? No, fortunately not. Don't kill any of us. Didn't kill any of us. But God used these mistakes we made to teach me about real faith. To teach me about being humble. He used it to teach me that it's more important to trust Him and His Word than the lies of the devil. That's a lot more important. He taught me that if I really say I believe in Him and I will obey Him, my character and my behavior will not change regardless of my circumstances. I will not be a grumbler. I will be a faith witness. So the question we have to ask ourselves, and that, that's a big part of the lesson I had to learn was, where are we in life? What is this life about? At the beginning of, of my testimony, I said to you that this life is not the promised land. You are not in the promised land. Yet. If you think you're always going to be successful, if you think everything is going to be easy, if you think life is going to be a, a pleasure all the time, you are mistaken and you will be disappointed. But through this process that I had to go through, I suddenly clicked, but I'm not in the promised land. I am in the wilderness. And now that I can understand it, my life is actually easier. Now I understand, okay, I'm going to face challenges. These challenges are going to be difficult, but God has, been, has given them to me for a specific purpose. You see, life without God on this earth is extremely painful. Life with God on this earth has got a purpose. So this one thing I think we can, we should be taking away from today is that please let's understand we do not live in the promised land. We are still on the way to the promised land. But through God's wisdom, He uses everything that happens to us on earth to sanctify us, to make us ready for the promised land. In the wilderness of the shutdown at Monday Richard's Bay, which was two months late, millions of euros overspent, I had to learn that when your resources are shallow, your faith has to be extremely deep. That's a good lesson to learn, it's not a bad lesson. I had to learn that 
as I said many times now, this life is the wilderness. But God's intention is not to kill us. His intention is to grow us and make us stronger and make us ready for eternity to come. I had to learn to be humble. Very difficult to be humble. And this humbling process, I might just add on, it's very easy how God exposed, exposes in your life what is really important to you. You will, you'll never admit it, but your title is important to you. Do you know that? At work you have this title. It's important to you. There's a certain picking order. It's important to you. You may not expressly state it, but when it gets changed for you, you, you see what becomes important to you. So if we look at if we look at our lives, I I realize there are many parallels to other stories in the Bible. <clears throat> and and again the I, I'm just gonna stick to the story of, of the Israelites and the, and their story. So God chose them. He also chose all of us. God saved them through Moses. He saved us through Jesus. God took them through the wilderness with the goal of getting into the promised land. God is taking us through the wilderness of this life with the goal of taking us to the promised land. So please do not be discouraged about the difficult things that happen in life. God uses this to grow your faith, to teach you that He is the God of molecules. He's the God of every single thing. To humble you and to prepare you for eternity. So I'm sure all you all of you want to know what happened to my pages. Okay, so <clears throat> we didn't find any flanges in South Africa for all of the reasons mentioned above. No flanges could be found. Eventually, we found. 45 forgings in Germany of the wrong material type <laughs> that after some intervention and prayer the design engineer said yes you can use it so half a million rand later a couple of airplane flights later our 45 forged PN160 EN 1092 flanges are up in South Africa in a big box and we installed them and we never delay the shutdown because of those plans. Now the question I want to ask you today is if God covered our flange mistake at the beginning, would I have learned any of the things I spoke about today? No. So even through all these difficult things, God did cover us with His grace. He always had a plan. Our God of molecules had 45 flanges waiting in Germany for me. But he said, yes, they are there, but no, I want you to first learn about true faith. I want you to go and read my word. I want you to understand that your thinking and your culture's thinking that this life is supposed to be the promised land is wrong. If it wasn't for this, I would have, not, I would have learned these things again. So today I could stand here and say, after going through all the pain and suffering just about my flange story, it was all worth it. Our boilers started up, the flanges are bolted on, they're not leaking, and in the process God taught me a number of deep and important lessons. And that is of more value than anything else. Because these are lessons about eternity. The other stuff we are busy with is all, is all temporary. It's all temporary. as I stand here I'm again reminded by by the first chapter in the book of James where James says count it for joy when you face challenges and you are tested count it for joy why? because it brings out deeper things in you don't try and get out too quickly don't run away too quickly these things are good for us it's good for us just like being in the wilderness is, was good for the Israelites it was good for them Let's pray together.
dear Lord, this morning I want to thank you for the opportunity we have to be, to be together. I want to thank you that you are the God of molecules. You are the God of, of our hair on our heads, Lord. You are the God of sparrows, of oxygen, of everything. Lord, thank you that we know that when we live a life with you, everything in this life has got purpose. I pray for everybody who's here today that all of us will understand this more and more deeply. That all the challenges you put in front of us is not to destroy us, it's not to hurt us, it is to sanctify us and make us more like you. Lord, may we pray, I pray today that all of us will start praying that our goal in life is to become more like Jesus. Lord, in the example, the example that Jesus set was an example of difficulty, overcoming difficulty. Lord, I pray that all of us, through your sanctification, will one day stand in front of Jesus and you'll be able to say, well done for overcoming the world. Lord, I know these things are sometimes difficult. In real life, these things are difficult. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us and remind us of your word, of your plan for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. You are such a gracious God.